welcome everyone to another uh, uh, webinar. Today, we're going to be talking about um, why you should examine your contract before signing it. Um, this is going to be a little different than a lot of the other webinars I've given uh, in that there's going to be a good deal of anecdotes. A big part of my practice as an attorney is dealing with contract disputes and issues where people signed contracts and then didn't realize what they were signing and needed to get out of it or they breached it. It's it's a whole thing. And so we're going to be going over a lot of that today as I show you examples of contracts and go over the different parts of a contract. I'm really going to be drilling down into what happens if you don't know about this part of your contract and um, some fun examples of how they can go wrong. So stick around and I'm glad you're with us today. So this presentation, I'm going to break it down into a few parts. We're going to go over some of the basics of contracts because it's important to understand how they work in the first place. Uh, we're going to talk about breaching contracts, which is really at the heart of why you need to read your contracts in the first place is because you need to know um, what can cause a breach of the contract and what the possible penalties are, the sanctions, the remedies, et cetera. What happens to you if you breach the contract? We're going to cover some of the most common, commonly breached things and some of the things that people really don't think about when they sign a contract, really things that are, you might call them gotcha provisions, things that can really um, come back to bite you later. Um, and again, I'm going to highlight why it's so important that you read these contracts. Um, and then finally, we're going to talk about representations and warranties, which are things that you promise are true and accurate. And, you know, if I had to pick one thing, one thing that people never really think to read and scrutinize, it's that last bit, the representations and warranties. But those are also what can really derail an entire contract after the fact. It can derail a business sale. It can derail pretty much anything else. So these are all very important things to keep an eye out for and more. Um, so we're going to cover it all. And like I said, throughout, I'm going to be giving you examples of what happens when you don't read these things. So to start, um, we're going to focus on written contracts and what to look out for. Verbal, oral contracts, they do exist. They are real. You can't review them. I mean, they're, they're not memorialized in writing anywhere. So you can't really review them to say, what did I just agree to? You're kind of relying on um, your understanding of the verbal contract and the other party's understanding. So, you know, a handshake deal sounds cool, sounds old school, um, never going to recommend them because you'll never have the predictability of a written contract. So we're going to cover written contracts here. And there's a few important contract maxims I talk about every time I do one of these webinars on contracts. It's just important to hammer these um, you know, bring these home each and every time. Um, the first, as I mentioned, good contracts are made in writing. Um, oral agreements can lead to a lot of misunderstandings and people who have different memories of the same contract. So avoid all that and just have something put down in writing. Um, they should provide clear and unambiguous expectations. And what that means is they, they need to be specific enough that two people can look at the same contract and not walk away with different understandings. You want everyone who reads this contract, including potentially a judge or a jury, to say, okay, it says this, it means this, I get it, I understand. Um, you really, you know, the devil's in the details and ambiguities, vagueness, like basic promises that don't have any meat and um, bones to them. Uh, you really want to avoid that to whatever degree you can. And so I get clients who ask me all the time, this contract is so long, does it have to be this long? We're just doing a simple, simple deal. And I say, well, here's all the ways that simple deal can go wrong if you're not very clear and concise in the contract. So contracts don't have to be, you know, a 200 page mammoth. We're not talking about a Tolstoy novel or anything, but they have to be long enough to be detailed. Um, and then last, contracts need to be predictable and enforceable. Um, you need to know, as does the other party, um, what's going to happen if you violate the contract, if they violate the contract, 
everyone should walk away with a clear understanding of what the potential penalties are for breach of the contract. Um, you really don't want to leave things up to chance or to, you know, whatever a judge or a jury ends up deciding, it should be spelled out. So with all that in mind, what's a breach of contract? Um, a breach is a failure to abide by the terms. It's not always the same as a default. Uh, you hear those terms bandied about interchangeably, but they're not the same thing. Um, a breach is just any violation of the written terms of the contract. So if the contract says you have to do this and you don't do it, that's a breach, plain and simple. But a default is um, kind of like breach plus. A default is something that a lot of contracts spell out that says, okay, if you breach the contract, that's bad. But if you don't fix the breach within a certain period of time, that's a default. And that's when our real remedies kick in. A lot of contracts provide that the remedies don't kick in until an actual default happens. So, you know, as an example, you've got the landlord tenant lease contract. Um, the tenant is obligated to pay the rent by the due date. Failure to pay the rent by the due date is a breach plain and simple, but the lease would often provide that you can't kick the tenant out until there's a default. And the default is if the tenant doesn't pay rent and then doesn't cure their non-payment within 15 days. So you give them a grace period of 15 days after which the tenant has moved from breach to default. And then once you're in default, that's when the real penalties kick in. You know, the landlord can terminate the lease, can call it immediately due and payable. Um, same thing with mortgages and loans. Um, you, you know, any breach is failure to pay within the prescribed time frame. but mortgages specifically, you see default provisions where it's like, okay, if you don't pay the mortgage and then you fail to catch up on your payments within, within 30 days, you're in default. And that's when we start foreclosure proceedings. So that's the difference between them. And it's just important to understand because when you're looking at your contracts and reviewing them, don't make the mistake of thinking any breach is fatal or that, um, you know, conversely, you need a default to have penalties because that's also not true. Even if your breach doesn't rise to the level of a default, um, the other party might still be able to go after you for damages. If, for example, you breach and then cure the breach, but you cause them damages in the process, you could still be looking at claims. So I just wanted to clarify those terms for you. Now, what are some remedies for breach? What are some common remedies that you're gonna see when you look at your own contracts? Contracts, like I said, good ones are gonna provide the remedies, which tend to fall into a few different categories. There's monetary damages. You know, if you cause me damages, you've gotta pay me money to make me whole again. That's you know, the basic rule of law is that um, damages are meant to make the other party whole, um, at least what's called compensatory damages are. There's punitive damages, which is just meant to punish the other party. You don't really see those specified in contracts. In fact, they can't be for the most part, but you'll see monetary damages. You'll see what's called injunctive relief, which is you going to the court and saying, they're doing something that is actively causing me harm. I want you to make them stop. And the court will often order them to stop whatever they're doing that's causing you harm. Um, conversely, there's this thing called specific performance, which is the inverse of that. Someone, is, someone agrees to do something under the contract and they don't, and that's causing you damages. You can go to the court and ask them to make the other party do what they promised to do. That's called specific performance. There are cases where specific performance is ordered and cases where it's not. Um, for example, if someone agrees to sell you their house, and they've signed the contract, closing is gonna happen in 60 days, and then the market goes gangbusters like it has right now. And home prices shoot up 20% in the span of a few months as has happened now. And the seller says, well, yes, I agreed to sell you this home at this price, but I can get a much better deal elsewhere. So I'm not gonna, uh, I'm just gonna walk away from this contract and you can sue me. Um, you can sue them and ask the court for specific performance, which is, um, Your Honor, make them sell that house to me. Um, and the court will in a lot of cases. Some cases they won't, but in a lot of cases where it's unjust not to, they'll make you go through with the sale. Where you don't see specific performance awarded typically is services. 
Um, if someone is supposed to provide you services and then they don't, um, the court will rarely, if ever, award specific performance. That's true of independent contractors, but especially true of employees. Um, 13th Amendment considerations and whatnot, um, a court is rarely going to order someone to provide services as an employee, if ever. Um, lastly, the court can issue other relief as provided in the contract. You can get creative to a degree, as long as that relief doesn't violate some legal rights of the other party. Um, you can get flexible to a degree. I'll just kind of leave it at that. Um, so I get these questions a lot, and these are kind of core to our presentation today. I'm not a lawyer and I wouldn't understand the contract even if I read it. Can I be excused from performance if I don't read it? Um, the answer by and large is no. Failure to read or understand the contract is not grounds to be excused from performance. Um, that is, I get this contract a lot with, you know, um, big old agreements that large companies have small companies or individuals sign. Think terms of service on iTunes, for example. Um, no one reads that. I'm a contract attorney and I don't read it. I have a general sense of what's in it, but you know, who's going to scroll through 40 pages of terms of service to use a piece of software? Um, I say I don't read it. Sometimes I do. I've actually read a few of those and they're all pretty standard. Um, those are kind of the exception to the rule in that um, you're not outright excused from performance for failure to read it, but there's certain laws that govern what can go into those things, into those click wrap agreements, but those are the exception to the rule because for everything else, for example, your leases, your vendor agreements, your client agreements, employment agreements, independent contractor agreements, all of that stuff, if you don't read the contract before signing it, that's on you. And that's, those are where the real issues come up. You know, it's, you're very rare that anyone's going to care if you don't read the iTunes service agreement, but if you don't read your lease for your commercial property, and then you sign on to rent a place for 10 years or more, um, you, you're expected to have read it. So you're on the hook for that. You're on the hook for potentially 10 years of lease payments. Um, the other question that I get a lot um, and I've already covered this kind of, but do I need the contract to be a long one? I've seen one or two page templates floating around on the internet. I just got off the phone with someone who asked me that question right before I hopped on this. Um, the answer is they don't need to be long, but again, they need to be long enough to accomplish what you want them to accomplish. You need to spell out with some degree of detail what each party is going to do. And so that means more than just a one pager. You can't cover all of what you need in a one pager and I'll explain why as we go, but um, they don't have to be long. Like I said, they don't have to be Tolstoy novels. We're not talking war and peace here, but they need to be long enough to cover what a contract needs to cover. Oh, and then question three um, and is kind of a late ad, but it was literally impossible for me to perform under my contract because of COVID-19. Is there a chance I can be excused from it? And the answer is yes, there's a chance. Most contracts have what's called a force majeure provision, which a lot of people think of as the acts of God clause. Basically, if, um, you know, if something happens that's so far beyond either party's control as to prevent performance, um, is the court still going to punish me for not performing? And really, it depends on what's in that force majeure clause. And I'm going to show you one that's pretty darn long. Um, uh, usually, they're about half this long, but these clients wanted me to get pretty, um, pretty specific uh, because this was made in the middle of COVID and actually had a lot to do with COVID-related services. So... This is a force majeure clause that says, um, you know, if these things happen, act of God, war, accident, fire, strike, lockout, labor, controversy, riot, civil disturbance, act of public enemy, any epidemic or pandemic, law, enactment, rule, restraint, order, act of governmental instrumentality or military authority, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If these things happen that are beyond other parties' control, um, that party will be excused uh, to a degree. If the issue goes on long enough, they can terminate the contract. 
Um, this is a particularly broad force majeure provision. And what a lot of folks saw going into COVID is that there were these force majeure provisions that did not include pandemic. And so you saw a lot of litigation in the early days of COVID over whether COVID-19 would count as an act of God. That just, that was the big legal question that if you're a court, um, keeping in mind that courts are a fairly secular institution in this country, how do you answer that question? Um, and I don't have an answer to that question. I, what I can tell you is you don't want to rely on the act of God language for something like COVID. So one thing that you want to make sure your contract has is a good force majeure clause that includes pandemic, assuming you want to be let out in the event of pandemic. Um, so when we're talking about why should I read my contract, this is reason number one. And this is the most glaringly obvious thing that everyone who signed a contract before COVID was kicking themselves for if they didn't have. So there's number one. Um, we're going to move on to some basic forms of breaches and really basic components of a contract. And I'm going to give you some fun examples for what happens when you don't read each of these. Now, contracts at their core are about the, two, the promises two or more parties make to one another. You can't have a contract with one party, so you can't have a contract with yourself. You need two or more parties. Um, typically, it, contracts take the form of one party promises to do something, the other party promises to pay them for it. That's the most common kind of contract. One party does something, one party pays them. But when you have these contracts, there's a few basics that you really need to make sure are right. Um, at a minimum, the contract should provide who, what, where, and when. Um, some contracts also provide why, which is cool, but not entirely relevant, but who, what, where, and when. So an example of who is a commercial lease agreement um, between two parties. Um, so-and-so, a New Mexico LLC, the lessor, you know, often commercial properties are held by an LLC, um, and then whoever, the lessee. Here's what happens if you don't make sure that the parties are right in the contract. Either you could be binding the wrong thing to the contract, an example in a commercial lease agreement, let's say you want your business LLC to be the lessee, the party who's on the hook for the lease, but you don't read the lease and then you sign it and it turns out your personal name is listed as the lessee. Oh, well, you are personally on the hook for that lease, even if your company folds. I mean, keep in mind with leases, you often are anyway because of personal guarantees, but this is like the first thing you need to check is making sure that the parties are absolutely right. Another example of what can happen if the parties aren't right and you're dealing with someone who's acting in bad faith, which I typically see with certain, um, certain industries is um, some industries, the party to the contract will deliberately sign with the wrong company and then say, um, this contract wasn't executed with the right company, therefore it's null and void. And they'll do that years after the contract is entered into. It's a losing argument and it's a bad faith argument, but it still can create headaches and litigation. So this is contract 101, make sure that the parties are correct. Um, like I said, basic contracts. Um, the what? is the next thing and it's just so vitally important. Um, what are the parties agreeing to do with these contracts? Um, you know, like I said, typically one party is gonna pay money, the other party is gonna provide services. Um, so you need to spell that out. And this is where I see a lot of people who send me a contract to review, they send me something incredibly vague that doesn't provide any kind of specificity. It's like, so-and-so will pay, um, you know, $3,000 and so-and-so will provide home repair services. What does any of that mean? How's the money getting paid? When's it getting paid? What are home repair services? Uh, you see the problem there is if you turn around and want to sue them for not providing home repair services, um, do they provide any home repair services? Maybe they're entitled to the full $3,000. 
Um, you have to get at least that specific in these contracts. So you want to review it and make sure that the what lines up with your expectations. For example, you want to make sure that what's getting paid is properly spelled out and how and when it's getting paid is spelled out. You see here, um, rent is due in 120 installments, each payable in advance on the first day of the calendar month. Um, it spells out what the rent is for the different months. I mean, it, it, it does what it needs to. And conversely, we're looking at you know an employment agreement. Um, it doesn't have to be overly complicated with employment agreements, but you want to spell out the term. When are they going to start as an employee? Um, are they going to be employed indefinitely until terminated, as is the case here? Um, in which case, you want to spell out at will. Um, and then what is the employee going to do? And again, this doesn't have to be a novel, but for example, you know, I put placeholders here, service one, service two. Um, if they're going to provide software development, you're going to spell out, you know, develop software for the company for use by end users, customers, clients, etc. You might also provide a service to uh, maintain and update that software, um, provide end user customer support if that's part of the role. Uh, you want to include enough so that um, you know the employee can't say that's not part of my employment. Um, but you also want to have this catch-all at the end so that you, as things come up, as long as it's reasonably related to the other things that you're already asking them to do, um, it's part of their employment and they can't make a fuss saying that's not part of my employment. You see what I mean? There's, there's a bit of a tension between being overly detailed and under detailed, but you, you want to make sure you're striking that balance. And if you don't list what they're going to do at all, that's way under where you need to be. Um, you know, again, compensation. If you're going to pay your employee, how are you going to pay them? When are you going to pay them? Um, this is a basic compensation plus bonus model. Uh, it spells out what you're going to pay them, when, um, leaves a lot of it up to the discretion of the company, but um, it gets the job done. And that's really the point with contracts. You should look at it and make sure it gets the job done. The where and when. Um, this is important for employees. It's important for um, uh, service providers, uh, whether that's for employees, you know, showing up five days a week, or whether that's service providers um, giving you a four-hour window on certain days, or if they're going to show up, you know, between eight and noon Monday through Wednesday to provide the services until the job's done. Just make sure that you're being specific enough with this. So where and when. Um, some notes on termination. And, you know, I talked about force majeure being the first thing you want to look for and make sure that it's right since, you know, we just went through COVID. Termination is the other big thing. This is one of those things where I'm like, make sure you know when you're about to sign a contract, how you can get out of the contract. And that's what the termination clause is for. Uh, because termination can be anything that the parties agree on, except obviously employment can't be indefinite, uh, things like that. But otherwise, you know, leases, this is the biggest, biggest thing is leases, I, I see. Um, people want to know how they can get out of their leases. And by and large, for commercial leases, the answer is you can't as the tenant, unless the landlord commits an act of default. Again, we talked about breach versus default. As a tenant, you often can't get out of the lease unless the landlord defaults. And so you, you want to make sure that you're looking at the termination provisions and really understanding how you can get out of the contract. Because, you know, for example, um, if, you're, if you're LLC, um, let, let's say you sign a commercial lease with your LLC as the lessee, the leasing party, and you personally guarantee that lease. And the... LLC goes under, the business goes under, and the termination clause says, well, you know, that's sad if you go under, but you can't terminate unless the landlord has committed an act of default. Well, the LLC can just go out of business and that's, you know, any contracts it signed, um, it can't really do anything about it. If the LLC goes under, that's the risk that the other party takes with contracting with an LLC. So in theory, you know, the, the lease just goes away anyway, except, with the personal guarantee, um, 
you know, with the personal guarantee, you personally are on the hook for the obligations of the lease. That's what a personal guarantee is. It's you as the business owner committing to pay the lease if the LLC doesn't for whatever reason. And so in a situation like that, um, you know, the personal guarantor is still on the hook. And so you really want to look for those things as well. Um, how can I get out of this contract? And that varies wildly by contract. I mean, some contracts will say either party can terminate for convenience with 30 days notice, which convenience being any reason or no reason at all. Some contracts only provide that you can terminate for cause and then they list cause. Um, you know, here's an example. Um, this is the commercial lease thing I was talking about. Uh, you can only terminate as the lessee in the event of a lessor default. Um, the, you know, it, like I said, it really does vary by contract. So know how you can get out of the contract. I don't think I can emphasize that enough because people come to me months or years down the road or tragically sometimes days after they sign a contract saying I've made a horrible mistake, I need to get out of it. And as a lawyer, you know, I can help you to a degree, but you're still bound by your contract unless there's some other way out of it. So it's a lot easier to know the contract in advance and then get it fixed to your liking than it is to try and deal with the consequences after you've signed it. Um, some other, we're gonna talk about some other common things in contracts that you might not be aware of, but that can really, that come back to bite you if you thought or expected the contract would have something different. Um, confidential information and intellectual property. I'm not gonna give you a lengthy diatribe on this, but um, you know, the, the gist of it is um, business owners, um, when you bring on an employee, an independent contractor or vendor, uh, they're gonna learn things about you just by virtue of working with you. They're gonna learn, for example, who your customers are. They're gonna learn how you do business, what your trade secrets are, what your intellectual property is. They might even see things like source code for your software. If you're hiring, for example, software developers to maintain your existing products, they're gonna get a lot of access pretty quickly to things that you don't want made public and that you don't want used to compete with you. And you might have the expectation as a business owner that, oh, well, they can't do that anyway because I'm their employer or you know they're independent contractors of me, but they're working for me. So I don't have to worry about that. And that is absolutely wrong. Um, you absolutely need to take steps within the contracts to protect yourself, um, which is, like I said, as um, when you're dealing with employees or independent contractors, you need to make sure that the contracts have certain things that protect you. And if they don't, you need to get them added. Conversely, if you are going to work for someone, whether as an independent contractor, an employee, or probably more at issue for folks attending this webinar is in a business to business arrangement. Um, let's say you're working with another company or business to develop some product and you expect that you are going to have some kind of ongoing interest in it. You need to make sure that the contract provides that because I see this all the time in business to business arrangements where the business, you know, one person thought, oh, you know, I'm going to have rights here because I'm contributing something. But the contract said the exact opposite. The contract said, no, this other business partner is going to retain all of the rights to this intellectual property. Um, you know, business A will have all the IP and they can do what they want with it going forward. And business two is just going to get a flat payment for their role in this. And then they walk away and they get nothing in an ongoing sense. So, you know, when I say read your contract, it matters for everyone. It doesn't matter if you're the employer, the employee, one business in a B2B joint venture partnership. Um, the IP stuff can really get you and, you know, not to cite the Winklevoss twins or anything, but um, it can have some real ramifications that maybe it's a few thousand dollars, maybe it's a few hundred billion dollars, uh, depending on if your product takes off or not. You never know until a few years later, but you don't want to find yourself in a position of saying, hey, you need to cut me in for a piece of this because of the work I did. 
they'll be the Winklevoss twins, not, not to pick on them. I mean, they, yeah, it is what it is, but it's a very public and popular example to use of um, not having these concrete agreements in place before you start contributing to something and not knowing what the agreement is with the other party. So really, um, let's have a look at some of the basics for IP. Um, we talked about things like software and um, website code bases, marketing materials, copyrighted materials, lots of things are changing hands here. So um, if you're the employer, for example, you're going to have folks who are contributing to that IP. You probably want to own that IP outright. You don't want to share the rights with the people who are contributing to it, whether that's employees or independent contractors. Um, employers do have certain rights to automatic um, retention of their IP that employees contribute to, um, but it never hurts to be specific in the employment agreement to make sure everyone's on the same page. But when you're dealing with independent contractors, nothing like that is guaranteed or automatic. So um, make sure you have provisions in your contracts that at a minimum um, restrict the service provider's use of your confidential information, um, require it return to you upon termination of the relationship. If you've got, like I said, independent contractors, make sure they give all your stuff back, same with employees, um, restrict their access to your IP in the first place and reassert your ownership over it. So it's there's no question at the end of the day that it's yours and that they have no rights to it. Um, and last, provide any contributions made to your IP or work made for hire, which means you're paying them to contribute to your IP. Um, like I said, that's kind of automatic for employees, but it's not at all automatic for independent contractors. So if we take a look at some of those provisions, this is what you might expect to see in your contract with respect to confidentiality. This is a basic clause that um, says, they're gonna get access to your confidential information. They're required to keep it confidential. They can't use it for their own proprietary gains. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it doesn't have to be complicated, but it does need to be there. And if it's not there, you wanna get it added, especially if you're the employer in this situation. I mean, if you're the employee, you're not gonna fight for things that are solely meant to protect the employer, but employers, and a lot of you folks are, it's incumbent on you to make sure that you have these things in your contracts. Um, here's an example of a work made for hire clause that, um, you know, it, it, it does what I mentioned. It treats any contributions made to your intellectual property as work made for hire. Um, a word of caution to anyone watching this and thinking, oh, I'm just gonna copy and paste these clauses from the slides. These are incomplete. Like I'm not showing you the entire confidentiality section or work for hire section. You can see these are subsections B. Um, there's more that goes into it, but I'm trying to show you the key snippets from the contract that you should look out for at a bare minimum. Um, you know, when we talked about breaches, um, here's what some breaches would look like. Selling your confidential information to third parties, to competitors who would love to get their hands on it and try and reproduce it without having to spend all the money you did on developing it. Um, you saw this a lot in the 90s, the late 90s and early 2000s with software companies. There was a lot of cutthroat poaching practices where you know software companies would try and get uh, the employees who designed software for their competitors to reproduce the same without having to spend all of the time and development costs. And if they could get some of that source code, all the better. Um, these contract provisions are meant to prevent that sort of thing happening in the future. There's also, you know, the laws developed around software over the last few decades, but you really don't wanna rely on them alone. Um, contracts are the first line of defense against employees doing these kinds of nefarious things or independent contractors, et cetera. Um, Another breach might be, for example, if you have these provisions, someone asserting a claim of ownership over the IP, which I've seen from time to time. They say, you know, I don't think that employment agreement's enforceable, so I'm going to pretend like I own this thing and I'm going to take it to a competitor. That's one of those situations where you're probably going to end up in a lawsuit to protect your rights, but having it in the contract really helps you protect your rights because if the rights are stated there, it's a lot easier for a judge to look at it and say, okay, 
yeah, this is pretty clear cut to me. Um, and then, like I said, using your trade secrets to compete against you. Common example of this is restaurants. If um, you developed a recipe book that took a lot of time and research and market studies and focus groups, and then you have an employee, a, a line cook who takes your book of recipes and then just goes right to a competing restaurant, um, that's a problem. And I've seen that in this town before. It's nasty. Those disputes are bare knuckle brawls. So uh, making sure that the employee understands that they can be personally liable for the damages they cause to your company. It's very important because if I'm the employee in that case, if I'm a line cook going from 12 bucks an hour to 15 bucks an hour, maybe if I take these trade secrets and then I understand that I'm going to be on the hook for tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars of damages. Yeah, I'm going to think twice as that employee. Um, consequences, again, this is a big thing when we talk about remedies, make sure, make absolutely sure when you have these protections in your contracts that they offer injunctive relief. Um, that is to say, you can take this contract and go to the court and say, your honor, look at what he's doing. He's causing me all kinds of damages. He's about to give my trade secrets to the competitor, make him stop, please, or the damages are going to become irreparable. At some point, there's going to be no way for me to recover from the harm he's causing. And the courts will often award that if your contract provides for it. Sometimes they'll award it if the contract doesn't, but you want to have the strong position of saying it's in the contract. Um, and again, there's the monetary damages. I just gave you an example where, you know, stealing a recipe book led to hundreds of thousands of dollars of damages for a local restaurant in town. Obviously, I'm not going to name them, but it was a nasty thing. So good contract. Um, finally, uh, well, not finally, I'm going to cover restrictive covenants really quick because this is something that if you're signing a contract that's going to create one of these for you and you don't know it, you're going to be in for a very, very nasty surprise later. Um, restrictive covenants, they're just like they sound, they restrict a party's activities. They restrict you from doing things like competing, soliciting employees or clients, or disparaging um, the other party. Um, they're pretty straightforward. I mean, they sound pretty straightforward, but non-competes and non-solicitations are the ones that really tend to cause damages. Non-disparagement Non-disparagement clauses, they're interesting um, because, you know, it's, I'll, I'll talk about them later, but they're, they're, I try not to think of them the same way as non-competes and non-solicitations. Um, non-competes, for example, these are the most commonly requested restrictive covenant and the most difficult to enforce. Um, New Mexico public policy disfavors their use with employees. New Mexico law bans them outright with respect to her, certain healthcare practitioners. And as a cherry on top, the Biden administration announced um, two weeks ago in an executive order that they are strongly encouraging, um, I think it's Department of Labor maybe, and they're, they're really pursuing it. They're trying to ban non-competes in most cases for employees. Um, there's policy reasons for and against them. I'm not going to get into the politics or the ethics or those sorts of considerations, but just know that they're already very hard to enforce. But if you're the employer and you're especially dealing with a situation, for example, where maybe you trained this employee from the ground up and you gave them a lot of proprietary information and you want to make sure that you get some distance from them, for example, a year or two, so that their information becomes out of date before they compete with you again, um, you want to make sure you have a non-compete. Conversely, if you're an employee and you don't want a non-compete, you need to check your contract to make sure there isn't one in there. Same for selling a business, um, you know, business sales. And this is a case where non-competes are actually enforced is um, if you're selling a business and you agree not to compete with the business you just sold for a period of years, that's very often enforceable. Um, courts look at that and they say, that's just an issue of right to contract. So, you know, it's really important to read the contract, the sale agreement, whatever, to understand uh, and know if you have a non-compete. If you want one and it's not there, put it in. If you don't want one and it is there, take it out. But failure to know about it does not prevent its enforcement. And I cannot emphasize that enough. Um, 
Here's an example of a non-compete. Pretty darn basic. It's a one-year non-compete preventing the employee from competing um, with the employer in a competitive business. Um, limited to 12 months and geographically limited to the employees in which employer does or does not conduct business. Um, it does or did, I'm sorry. Um, but that's a non-compete, pretty standard. So look out for that in the contract. Like I said, if you want it, great. If you don't, take it out. Non-solicitation, um, they're actually very different from non-competes. They get lumped in and conflated a lot of the time, but they're very different. Um, Non-solicitation, you see these in employment agreements, independent contractor, vendor agreements, um, and very commonly in B2B arrangements, business to business arrangements, or joint ventures where the parties are sharing information about their clients, um, their employees, et cetera. A non-solicitation agreement is an agreement not to poach. You're agreeing, you're agreeing not to try and lure that party's employees or customers or clients away from them. It's not the same thing as agreeing not to employ their employees if they independently leave and then come to you, but it's agreeing not to poach them. Um, they, they still have to be reasonably limited and they might be unenforceable in certain contexts. For example, your non-solicitation agreement can't prevent a business from doing business with your customer because that's seen by the courts as a restraint on those customers and who they can do business with. It creates antitrust consequences and complications, um, monopoly issues. I mean, you, you really want to avoid overdoing it with non-solicitation, but if you do them right, they can protect you as the business from having your entire business stolen out from under you by someone who, like I said, they know your methods, they know your processes, um, they might not have your goodwill, they might not have your good relationships with these customers, but if they go to these customers and say, hey, come do business with me and I will give you a 40% discount for the first year, a lot of those customers are going to leave you. And so a non-solicitation is meant to prevent that. So if you're an employer, or if you're in a B2B arrangement, um, you really want to make sure that your contract has this and make sure that it says what you want it to say. Remember, it's never enough just to know that the contract has it. The devil is in the details and you want to make sure that it works for you. Here's an example of a non-solicitation. Um, prevents um, the former employee from poaching anyone who is an employee or was an employee of the company. Nice and simple. Um, you see variations of this to include clients and customers, et cetera. Finally, we've got non-disparagement agreements. And these are fun because um, these, are, these are agreements that you see come into play when there's a lot of bad blood between the parties. Um, typically, I include them in settlement agreements so that the parties know they can't just go around and start disparaging or defaming the other party right after the settlement goes through. I mean, you got to take some time, cool off, and then hopefully after that cooling off, the parties have just gone their separate ways and forgotten about each other. But non-disparagement agreements are just as they sound. They're meant to prevent the other party from making disparaging remarks that could harm your business reputation or personal reputation, and as the case may be. Here's an example. Um, pretty straightforward. Um, this one is very uh, one-sided. Most of the non-disparagement agreements I do are um, bilateral, uh, reciprocal. Both parties agree not to disparage the other, but this is one where the employer insisted, um, I want the employee to not disparage me, but I don't want to have that same obligation, which problems abound if you try and enforce something like that. I told this client, um, there's a good chance this one will not be enforceable. For that reason, um, courts don't like obligations that aren't reciprocal, but um, here's a non-disparagement agreement. So if you are the kind of person who wants to be able to speak their mind without fear of repercussions, um, make sure you don't have one of these because I've seen people try and act on non-disparagement agreements for everything from third-party hearsay you know, I heard so-and-so told so this other person that I was bad at business. I mean, it's petty stuff to Yelp reviews. I mean, I've seen people try and act on non-disparagement agreements when a former employee or customer or whoever um, made a bad Yelp review. 
or bad Better Business Bureau complaint, um, things like that. So that's kind of what their purpose is. Uh, I've never litigated one. At the end of the day, when I tell the parties, look, you're going to spend 30, 40, 50 grand litigating this to trial if uh, it goes that far, they cool off. But you know, be on the lookout for this so that you understand what you're agreeing to, because uh, if you don't want to be bound and have this hanging over your head where you have to wonder if what you're saying is defamatory or disparaging, then maybe take this out. Some final considerations with restrictive covenants. Um, if you're gonna have them, make sure that they have these things, the blue penciling and severability. Uh, basically, they let the court reform the restrictive covenants if they're too broad, the court can say, okay, I'm gonna limit them to maybe one year or just the city of Albuquerque. Um, so you let the court reform it instead of throwing it out entirely. And then severability is where if the court is gonna throw out and throw it out entirely, you wanna make sure that they're not throwing out the entire rest of the contract because that's bad. Um, because you know if you've got an employment agreement with a non-compete, and all these protections for your intellectual property and the non-competes too broad, you don't want the court to throw out the entire employment agreement because then those IP protections get thrown out with it. So you have what's called a severability clause that says if any portion of this contract is unenforceable, strike it, but the rest of the contract stands and those tend to be honored. Finally, we're gonna talk about restrictive covenants. Um, I'm sorry, representations and warranties. We're gonna talk about what they are, what they do. They're basically what they sound like. You as a party are representing and warranting to the other that a certain set of facts are true. That's all they are. You're spelling out in the contract a set of facts and promising that those facts are in fact facts. I love that sentence. Um, the the most common ones I've outlined here. Um, these are typical on pretty much any um, contract that I draft, which is just, um, you know, the, the seller of a business, for example, he's representing and warranting that he's authorized to enter into the contract in the first place, because some people who are sub subject to a, a receivership, court order, guardianship, conservatorship, um, and Britney Spears is the common example of the conservatorship and how that you know, plays out. But if you're subject to one of those things, you might not have the freedom to enter into a contract. And so you're promising the other party with this, yes, I'm free to enter into this contract. The thing I'm selling is mine. I have not sold it, promised it to anyone else, leased it, loaned it, pledged it, etc. cetera. Um, I'm not bound by any other agreement to sell it or whatnot. Um, and that everything I'm saying in this contract is true and accurate. Um, and so those are basic representations and warranties. You wanna promise that you're able to contract. But then where you get into the more specifics, um, this is where it's really important in um, purchase and sale agreements, for example. You wanna make sure that if you're the buyer, the seller is representing and warranting that the company has no um, outstanding taxes, no lawsuits you're aware of, no employee grievances or complaints you're aware of, that they're aware of, um, things like that that might crop up after you buy the business that would really impact the value of it. Because taxes are a huge example. Um, if you buy a business and the previous owner didn't pay gross receipts taxes for a period of seven years, eight years, 10 years, whatever, um, tax and rev can go back in most cases seven years to audit these things. And so you could be buying a company with seven years of unpaid gross receipts tax. Same with um, payroll taxes. I mean, you could be buying a true liability trap if the previous owner didn't pay payroll taxes. So you want to make sure at the very least that they're promising that all the taxes have been paid. Why does that matter? Because if it turns out that the taxes aren't paid, that's a breach. It's a breach of the representations and warranties. And so you then ask, okay, um, they've breached the representation and warranty that the taxes were paid. What happens now? You can sue them for breach, which is just a basic contract claim. They've breached the contract and has caused you damages. Or 
your contract can get more specific. For example, it could have what's called an indemnification clause that says, um, I am, have made these representations and warranties, and if they're not true, I promise to pay you all of the damages that result from it, including, without limitation, your court costs, your attorney's fees, if you have to enforce this against me, um, including any other penalties you might have. The point is, these are the stepping stone that leads to those measures of relief for you as the other party in this contract. So you need to make sure that the representations and warranties are accurate and thorough. Um, like I said, when you're buying a business, you want to make sure that you include all of these different things um, at a minimum. And you can get more specific. Um, I've seen representations and warranties that are about five pages mm -hmm. long. But um, that's what they are and that's why they matter. Um, the other reason they matter is because um, they speak to um, the other party's motive for signing a contract in the first place. If they're represent, representing and warranting that certain things are true, like the company is worth what was disclosed and that the taxes were paid, and then you find out that's not true, you were misled into signing the contract. And you can make that argument to the court if, for example, you want to try and unwind the contract, saying, Your Honor, I was misled here. Um, I would like this contract to be rescinded. That's a relief you could seek from the court. They don't often grant it, but you could seek that relief if um, the representations and warranties turn out to be false. So it's really important, but it's also important from the other side. If you are the party making these promises, and keep in mind, each party makes promises. Each party should have representations and warranties. But if you're making promises, you need to make sure that what you're promising is true and accurate and that you're not overpromising. I see this a lot with clients who send me sale documents they got off the internet, like a purchase and sale agreement, and the representations and warranties say X. And I ask them about it, and they're like, oh, no, that's not the case at all but you're promising that in this contract. So really scrutinize it and make sure that you're not promising anything that isn't true, because even if you don't think it's material, the other party might, or they might just use that as an excuse down the road if they're looking for an out. So representations and warranties, read them carefully. So in conclusion, what can I do to protect myself? Have good contracts know what's in the contracts you sign. Uh, this is the whole point of this webinar. Know what's in the contracts you sign before you sign them, and then plan ahead to meet your obligations instead of figuring them out after the fact. Because at the end of the day, um, and I tell this to people all the time, if you're gonna hire an attorney, and you know, I talk about utilizing your resources, it's really important to utilize them. Um, the SBDC, obviously, um, a good contracts attorney will go a long way here. Um, but if you're going to utilize your resources, you need to utilize them early. Because if you're hiring me as an attorney to review a contract that you haven't yet signed, I can look at it and I can propose all kinds of changes. But if you're hiring me to look at a contract that you already have signed and you want to know what you just signed, if you don't like the news I give you, um, I can't help you. Like, I, I can't except in a few limited cases, I can't get you out of the contract you just signed. So use your resources and use them early. And to that end, I'd highly, highly, highly recommend reaching out to the NMSBDC. Um, go to the website, SB, nmsbdc.org. Look at some no-cost business counseling um, as kind of a good first step to get your grounding as you figure out, you know, maybe what do I need as far as contract or uh, what are my resources to better understand the contracts that I need and the contracts that I have that people are asking me to sign? The SBDC has a great network of resources of attorneys they know of across the state. So if they can't help you, they can certainly point you in a good direction.